Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief at Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here with Andy Nightingale of our Terrace. We're going to talk today about the need for physically aware network on chips. Andy, when you look at the complexity of some of these chips that are coming out, we have billions of transistors. We've got lots of different domains. We've got multiple components. Some are prioritized. Some are partitioned in different ways. What's the importance of understanding the physical part of this, all the physical effects that potentially can come into a, uh, a design? So when you look across the different market segments in our industry, uh, from embedded to enterprise applications, the, the trend for increased functionality, security, uh, in some cases, um, safety, reliability, this continues to rise year on year. So this, in turn, increases the, the challenges that need to be met by the, the design teams uh, to integrate very complex IP blocks together. That has further impacts expected at advanced nodes from seven nanometers um, and below. So the glue that guarantees optimal integration uh, is the network on chip, uh, which we're seeing typically accounts for about 10 to 12 percent of the area of the system on chip itself which already has really strict uh, power, performance, and area budgets. So all these factors are further compounded by the need to, to get to market as quickly as possible. And with the availability of expert system engineers at a premium, so many of our customers are opting for bringing in a more of a third-party silicon-proven IP versus in-house solutions purely to reduce risk in already tight schedules. And the problem is, with all of these pressures on top, um, the actual combination of um, all of the constraints required, the architecture, the requirements um, of the individual connectivity of the blocks, and then the final layout um, that happens you know, days later, the iteration on layouts can take actually weeks, even though the architecture itself takes maybe you know, a day or two to put together. So how do you bring these disciplines together? You actually need to be aware, this is the physical awareness part, of the actual implementation of the design, the layout of the chip itself. So you know where to put the knock architecture into, the gaps, if you like, in the design, where you actually have to pour this knock logic to connect all the, all the components together inside the chip. So let's take a closer look. Sure. Andy, what are we looking at? Yeah, so on the left-hand side of the screen, uh, we see a high-level whiteboard view of a SOC design or a, a hardware architecture intent to give it its, its formal name. And this in contrast with a, a final implementation view below it in the same design. So the final view represents the result of weeks of work. And the number of weeks really depends on the complexity itself of the design. So this is because uh, as we go down the abstraction levels on the right, from high level software downwards towards hardware implementation, the amount of time spent in each of these abstraction levels, um, development loops tends to increase significantly in effort. So going back to the whiteboard view for a moment, this will further be refined into a specification of the uh, compute elements and peripherals and a specification of the knock interconnect that joins them together. And in fact, um, this knock is very well aligned here with enabling customers with partners to capture the knock specification and then refine that into a knock topology itself and to run analysis on the topology to validate that the performance specification is theoretically going to be met. Once this iteration process is completed, then the RTL is actually generated. And this process takes you know, in the region of a, a, a few hours perhaps to do. And when you understand all these these configurations and all the different elements that go in here, the advantage is that you can now shrink down exactly what you need in terms of space too, right? I mean, this can be a very tight knot. Um, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Different components here um, obviously have a physical size. You know, that we call them blockages in the design and the floor plan. And um, if, when you have a, a, a initial view of the floor plan or the, the, the block layout, you can actually place you know, the CPU elements in there, the memory control elements, the DRAM elements. Um, and the, the actual gaps uh, between these elements are where the knock itself flows. So the, the trick is to actually get these as close together as you physically can to save area. But 
give enough space, if you like, for the, the knock topology to flow around it and connect everything up. Where do engineers typically run into problems when you're doing this? The problem comes when the layout team find issues in the physical implementation of the design. Uh, for, exa for example, the, the design not meeting timing. So, you know, designing the knock at an architecture and RTO level without taking physical layout constraints into consideration, well, this can really lead to significant schedule unpredictable, unpredictability and project risk as the layout team have to converge on timing for each operation. And that might take weeks. However, the, the configuration, the knock and the topology really only takes uh, hours. What you're looking at here is the way things have been done in the past. It's always been sort of, here's the wall. Uh, one group does one thing, then it gets handed down to something else. The problem is that all of this now has to be considered together. You've got a lot of different pieces going into a an advanced node design. How does that all that work, and where does the knock fit into this? Yeah, sure. So you know, clearly, the problem scenario that we just discussed is is well known in the SOC design space, and SOC designers employ many strategies to try and minimize the risk here. So in order to reduce the risk to schedule unpredictability at the back end layout phase, it's common uh, for designers to involve their system architects um, and or designers to provide some manual guidance at the knock architecture phase. An early floor plan may be used as a, a reference point and the knock topology created uh, in mind uh, with the major IP blocks of, of the design. So pipeline stages will then manually be added into the design uh, to break the long timing paths. And that does involve some level of estimation and guesswork. And actually, as the uh, design iterates through, um, even with this manual expert estimation, it's very common in today's complex designs for a timing closure issue to cause the team to revert back to the architecture in order to, to break up the connections and have to insert more pipelines. And the constraints for place and route accordingly need to be updated and another round of synthesis and place and route is then started. So uh, in this customer example, um, we've in, in customer examples we've studied, if we look at the project schedule tracker along the bottom, we see that the manual guidance enhanced topology and floor plan part of the flow can, any, can take anything between two weeks to just over a month. And in comparison, because of the longer iteration time, time enclosures, you know, in this one example, took up to 70 days to complete. So how do you speed all this up? I mean, how do you solve this problem and get this done in a reasonable amount of time? Because everybody's under deadline pressure right now. Exactly. I mean, firstly, we can automate the layout information and capture it inside the knock design environment. So here, the knock design tools uh, can then take over the job of, of measurement an estimation right off of that floor plan. And secondly, we can use this knock IP and floor plan data to automate the insertion of pipeline stages into the design, and it replaces that manual insertion step. And when um, pipelines are provisioned manually, uh, there's always an over provisioning that happens because the designer in the back of their mind or the architect in the back of their mind, they've got the layout team in mind, they know it's going to take weeks to get the design back. So they always put too many pipeline stages in just to be safe. Um, and that causes extra area to be created, extra power consumption. We really do need to optimize this and we really need to automate these, these uh, phases to reduce that, that error bar. How does this work when you start going into advanced packaging where you have lots of different potentially new levels that are actually coming in here? So, so really, um, Talking about the advanced packaging, we tend to split the design up you know, in, into these different layers. We tend to isolate the knocks themselves, and we can do that in the, in the tooling. And if we zoom in to, uh, for a moment into the design, we can actually look at the, uh, the reason for estimating the number of pipeline stages, as I mentioned earlier. There's a number of dependencies that should otherwise ideally be suited to uh, machine automation. So we can actually see here that the um, the, the, the design says that it wants to cross the SOC in, in one uh, cycle, but that's just not possible. The machine can actually measure that. It can work out exactly the number of pipeline stages and insert those in. And again, as the knocks are layered and they're connected together, 
this will actually happen on a knock by knock basis as we uh, we we get the machine to optimize it out. How far can this be optimized? I mean, is it something that is just fixed, or can you really twist it in, into all things that are very customized for this chip? Yeah, I mean, we we really have uh, ultimate customizability because because we've got the floor plan in mind, as you see here. We can ultimately move the blocks around. So if it's a real uh, issue for us, you know, we're actually meeting these timing paths going across the chip. Uh, we could, for example, take the CPU and actually move it closer to the, the memory controller itself. So the knock is ultimately configurable. And um, if there's ability to move around the blocks in the floor plan, you know, that would be the ideal solution. And the, the closer it is, the less power it uses, the more efficient it is, the longer the battery lasts, and also the faster you get your results, right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Uh, what we really want to do is get that CPU as close and lower latency as we can to the external you know, memory, the high bandwidth memory, and the other, uh, say, uh, uh, late, more latency tolerant devices, they can sit further away. So you know, we can really uh, go to town with the optimization here if we have the layout in mind at the same time. We can either advise, even advise you know, where the layout block should go uh, and then reconfigure the knock accordingly. You also, because you really understand how how this can be laid out and, and all the physical constraints, you can add some resiliency in here as well, right? I mean, if something goes wrong here, you can say, okay, we can add extra circuits in here that make this work no matter what. We can turn them on, turn them off. Yeah, I mean, resiliency is, is a big thing, um, not only in fun functional safety applications, um, but also, you know, when we have um, really advanced nodes, you, you know, you, act you actually end up sometimes having dark silicon. So you do actually require the um, uh, the duplication in the design and perhaps alternate not pathways to actually get to the same um, conclusion or the same functionality. So this is again is 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 really um, important as we go down, you know, be below say seven seven nanometer, for example, um, we can have you know different paths through to you know duplicated uh, logic components. You know, we can have all the standard error checking stuff in there as well to. Uh, report back to fault controllers. There's a lot we can do here in the resilience space, not only to you know uh, Im improve the yield, uh, but also actually improve functional safety of design itself. So looking out over maybe the, the next few process nodes over the next five, 10 years, what happens here? What changes? Okay. So as we go into into the sort of lower process nodes, um, what we'll be doing is we'll certainly be evolving into the uh, chiplet structure. Um, we'll be talking about having perhaps accelerators on uh, on the uh, on different chiplets uh, connecting into the same systems. You might even have different process process node chiplets actually connecting together, um, as one might uh, perhaps progress at a different maturity rate than another. So. Uh, in all of this, uh, these circumstances, the physical awareness is is still key. I mean, every single one of those sort of chiplets, the system on chip, you know, needs as optimal um, and as resilient uh, configuration as possible as it moves forwards. So we don't see this technology going away. And as we actually uh, see more and more designs, our database, you know, our knowledge base of how we actually solve these problems gets better. So we can only see that our technology is improving year on year. Um, and actually we can do more and more automation in this space and actually reduce, uh, keep reducing risk further, even though um, the, um, the Moore's law problem is continuing and the complexity is going up and the number of you know, billions of transistors increases. So you know, we see our, our technology actually growing with that and going to the next generation. Andy Nightingale, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you, Ed.